Is Tyler Van Dyke going to be a good quarterback with Wisconsin? We've got a great guest to talk about all that and a bunch more. Welcome to the Bucky Report. Welcome to the Bucky Report, your destination for all things Wisconsin Badgers. Authentic takes. Oh, my God. Game analysis. Touchdown, Badgers. Ring one up. And discussion from the fan perspective. Thanks for joining us and on Wisconsin. Welcome into the Bucky Report. We are your hosts, Rajiv and Justin, in for our full weekend episode to talk about all things Wisconsin Badgers. We are at the Bucky Report on Twitter, YouTube, and wherever you get your podcasts. We've got a great guest for you today. Uh, if you don't follow at Guard Your Fickle on Twitter and Badger Notes, let me tell you something. You will be a lot happier in your life if you do. He puts out incredible content. Austin, Guard Your Fickle, thanks for joining us. How are you doing today? Welcome to the Bucky Report. Good. Yeah, doing great. Uh, thanks, Rajiv, Justin, for, for having me. I'm excited to talk uh, some Badger sports with you guys. Yeah, yeah, it's really good, man. You, it's, it's your your articles are great. I mean, it's it's I I'm a I'm a I'm a numbers guy like you. I know you were a finance guy. I'm a finance guy myself. I just think numbers are great, and what you can really dig into them and get out of them. And I don't like to do all the research that you like to do. So I just like to read your stuff and then have you come on and talk about it, which is which is great. So that's what we're gonna Perfect. do. I'm kind of um, the same way. I but I go on intuition of what I see and kind of like I. It feels like it's this. Does do the numbers follow it? So totally exactly different. exactly. Um, so Austin, let's start here a little bit. Just talk a little bit about where can people find your work. Uh, obviously, you're on Badger Notes, but tell people where where they can find you. And honestly, and how did you get into this kind of stuff? I mean, we you're all, all you're you're so into the data and analytics. Why are you so into it? Yeah. Um, well, first you can find my stuff right on, on Badger Notes um, and then mainly just on Twitter is uh, where I do a lot of uh, posting there, uh, usually a live, live tweeting the games, um, um, just kind of what I'm seeing. And then for basketball, especially post uh, some, some good stuff there in the game to kind of give you a, a good barometer of where we're at and where the opponent's at. Um, and that's at Guard Your Fickle on uh, Twitter. X. Um, so that's where you can find me. Uh, how I got into sports analytics um, is pretty pretty new um, for me. I've uh, been playing sports my whole life, um, but kind of read Moneyball, and it's probably like a lot of, a lot of people, right? You read Moneyball. Um, I actually watched the movie before I read the book, um, so I had some preconceived notions going into that, but pretty cool. And then just kind of got into the rabbit hole of that. And obviously, right, you talked about um, finance, kind of the numbers is, is really what I like to dig into. Um, so kind of having that, that avenue for, for me was, was pretty great. So got into it and I really just started doing the, the deep dives into it um, last year before the football season, um, which was a pretty tumultuous one. Um, haven't had a lot of success uh, to write about from an analytics side for the football, but yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. Excellent. So yeah, again, he's on at, uh, at guard your fickle on Twitter. <clears throat> And of course, on BadgerNotes.com, yep. tons and tons of great content on there. All right, guys, as we start every week, let's get into it. Three big takes from the week. Justin, lead us off. What are your three takes of the week? Well, uh, number one is going to be it's portal part two that we're seeing from last year to this year where we're diving in and it's clear that the coaching staff feels like they need to upgrade the, the talent level of this roster, which I think is something that we felt watching them this personally this season. Um, number two, I'm going to, I'm going to jump on the volleyball one with you there and say rough end of the season for the girls. You know, they, they played so well all season long. Uh, you would have liked to see them go out a little bit more competitively in that, that last match with Texas, but it looks like Texas is a buzzsaw beating Nebraska today in a sweep and just crushing them. So, you know, we did better than Nebraska did. We, we held it down for the big 10 in that regard. Um, but would have liked to see better. And, there's a couple of, you know, National Signing Day coming up this Wednesday. One of one of my Christmases, personally, um, getting to see what happens. I'm hopeful that we can get see a Xavier Lucas signing on uh, Wednesday, having just went to Miami. So that's my big one. Just putting it out there, Xavier, we need you. Uh, that guy, I feel like, has a chance to be a lockdown corner, honestly, at the at the Power Five level. All right, Austin. Three takes from the week. Anything you want to yeah. talk about? 
Uh, you know, Arizona, I guess you could still maybe call it within the week, um, was a really tough loss, but the Badgers are still top 20 in Kempom, and they're a lot better than people are giving them credit for. Mm-hmm. Uh, second, Fickle and company are, are starting to reload this roster with some dudes, um, and we should be pretty excited about that and getting our talent up to the level of where it needs to be to compete with, with the top teams. Um, and then uh, Chucky Hepburn is – is in a shooting funk right now, but once he gets that going, uh, Badger basketball is going to take it to even another level than what we're seeing right now. Yeah, and we are definitely going to get into some Badger basketball as well. <clears throat> in addition to football, we're going to talk a lot about Tyler Van Dyke. My three takes are, number one, Texas was a deserving champion. I mean, it's it sucks what happened to the Badger volleyball team, but they are deserving champion. They played unbelievably against us. I was actually watching part of the game with one of my friends who's a college volleyball player, and she was just she was getting so excited watching what Texas was doing, her sl- their slides and all these kinds of first terminology that I don't know anything about. But man, like they outplayed us. And then to see them beat Nebraska, that's good. Number two, Fickle is checking off his list of targets and doing it better than I originally expected. I did not expect to see check, check, check when it comes to the target, when it came to the target list and positions. And number three, this is a bit of a, a big take, and it's going to be controversial, but we're going to talk about it. A C, Connor Seijin will transfer at the end of this season. I don't see it, guys. I really don't. And and I, we're going to get into it. Uh, but that's a little teaser for you there for our basketball segment because I, I just I can't see what's happening with him. I it, it, I don't think you miraculously just get better at playing defense. So I, I think that you know this clearly is an issue for guard, but we'll get into that. Um, let's start our discussion with football. If you haven't on uh, seen on Badger Notes yet, <clears throat> Austin, uh, actually just today, I think, Austin, you posted um, a new deeper dive article into Tyler Van Dyke. So let's start there. Like, actually, first, let's let's because this is the first time we've had you on your sh- on our show. Number one, how did you become a Badger fan? And number two, give us your overall take on Luke Fickle's first season in charge. Yeah. Uh... Became a Badger fan just through through my dad mostly. Um, he's a diehard Badger fan, um, and just kind of you know just got ingratiated that way. And, and obviously, um, younger guy, so had a lot of success in my tenure as a Badger fan. Um, so it was easy to kind of stick on that boat and and not jump jump ship uh, anywhere else. Um, what are my thoughts on Luke Fickle's first year? I think, I mean, obviously. Um, given what the schedule was and, and all the hype related to what they did in the portal um, coming out of the off season last year, um, obviously a huge disappointment. Um, but I think the more you bring in the context of what happened, um, especially from an injury standpoint, I mean, first to, to Chesma Lucy and then to Tanner Mordecai um, and just having those guys out for such, such a big and important stretch of the season where we, we faced really, uh, the, our toughest opponents um, in Iowa and Ohio State, not having having those guys, I think, took the wind out of the sails um, for this group, and they never really got it back. Um, they showed some signs of of really good play, um, and, and what it what I think is really to come, especially as he kind of influxes more of his talent um, into the program. Um, so that is really exciting, but you just really you only saw glimpses of what I think this can be. And, and for that, it's, it's just a pretty big disappointment for what I think a lot of Badger fans and myself included expected for this year. Yeah. Um, Rob, uh, also, we are getting a little feedback from your mic, by the way. And we had a couple okay. of comments in here about that too. So you might want to check that and, or maybe readjust your AirPods or something. But in the meantime, while you're doing that, Justin, <clears throat> we're going to come back to, we're going to talk a lot about Tyler Van Dyke when Austin gets his mics going a little bit, but Let's talk about football wish list. Okay, it's holiday time, right? What's what's on your wish list now? What have you seen from everything that, that Fickle has done so far and the people that he's brought in? Obviously, we got we got a couple new guys, by the way. Tyrell Henry, the wide receiver out of Michigan State. That's that's been a nice addition. Um, McGowan, the tight end out of LSU. What's on your wish list? What's left that that's that we don't have yet? Well, I think right now the, the biggest question is they clearly need a big body guy who can stretch the field somebody who can really push kind of open the up the offense in the middle of the field in the intermediate area for our slot guys to work a little bit more um the other part i would say is i I, there's been discussion there's there's been hints to some some players that might be coming so i don't want to get too in the weeds on it because there it may influence 
some of the other things that are going on with the team in terms of roster building. So we, I, I'll just be vague there for right now. We'll discuss it more after Wednesday. Um, but I think that there is a lot of things that we're looking at from that standpoint that we really truly need. The wide receiver is the first one. Defensive line, I think we cannot be understated how much we need to add to that right now. Um, we just need some difference makers there. And I'm not sure that's something you necessarily get through the portal. But I think you can find some guys, hopefully some young guys that are looking for opportunity that maybe you can develop. And I, we have a big kid from Florida State that came in. I, For the life of me, I can't say his name. <laughs> I don't want to butcher it. Um, but he's on uh, a visit this weekend. And if we can get him in, I think that's a good start. I believe he's 6'4", 299. So he's a guy who can play that nose guard, nose guard position or possibly a strong side defensive end in this scheme. I'm not sure how sudden he is, but if he's got some pass rush ability, we'll take all that we can get right now. Um, I really like what we've done so far with the outside linebacker guys that we brought in. Yeah. So I think there's some opportunity really from a defensive standpoint to build this. And I think, honestly, we probably still need to do some work on the offensive line because I'm not totally sold on what's going to come back. Like We could see a couple guys jump ship on that yet. So I'm hopeful that they know what they're working with there and – are kind of just being measured in what they're looking at in terms of going after guys. But right now I think I really like what they've done. I really like Henry. I didn't, I haven't been able to weigh in on him too much, but watching some of his film, very sudden guy who looks pretty elusive. I'm not sure he's a field stretcher, but he's very quick. So he's a guy that I think will be able to do some things in the underneath stuff that I think will, will help us because I do think he can play on the outside. So he's more of an intermediate guy who's quick and can do some things. If he, I could see him, him running a lot of, uh, oh, what am I? A lot of, uh, try to think here. The RPO game, I think he's going to be really beneficial with him. It, that, I guess, is the best way to put it. But I think that he's a, he's a nice ad. He get, he'll give us some versatility on the outside guys. He's more of an Anthony type receiver. Especially with DK leaving, right? We did need to add something to the receiver room, and I think that's good. And, of course, when you add McGowan, you add another piece of a, of a receiving crew. We said this on Wednesday, and I'll say it again. For me, it's just all about the lines. I mean, I, I don't – I'm super, super happy that we got outside linebacker at least somewhat taken care of now, and I think that's good, and we, we added people. Now we can still add more, but – we we've got to fix the lines. There's there's to me. I, I want to see the next guy coming in an offensive lineman or a D lineman. Period. Like I, I want multiple people at that position because we virtually had no one backing up the O line this season. Virtually no one, or at least no one that Fickle was ready to play. The D line just wasn't good enough. And I mean, as a guy, by the way, I'm a Colts fan, as you all know from the helmet behind me. I got to I watched and it was the first Steelers game that I've actually watched um, fully. And Keanu Benson is so good, by the way. <laughs> he's going to be such a good NFL player, and I love it. I said um, he'd be Irving. a Pro Bowl, multi Pro Bowler. Yeah, he's coming out. Just, I figured that it seeing, was it would translate. Seeing him at that level is so cool too, because he's just he ate our offensive lineman up, and he had swallowed up like two or three of them at a, at a time, which is great to see. But it proves the point. That once again, we have to get help on the D line. Uh, Austin, are you back with us? Yeah. How's the audio? Is it a little bit better? Much better. Yeah, much, okay. much Great. better. Yes. Excellent. Yeah. Perfect. Sometimes, you know, the mics can get a little crazy, but yeah. Um, yeah. what about you, Austin? What are, what's on your holiday wish list as far as positions that you feel like we need to attack next? Yeah. I, I think middle linebacker, I think we still need to get a guy there. I love what they've done with Lowry and Pius. I think those guys are exactly what we need um, from from the outside, especially within the scheme that uh, Trestle's got. Um, and then I love what Allegrio is, um, but I'd love to have a little bit more depth at that position. Um, I know they got two guys in this weekend, the, the North, Northern, Northern Iowa guy, excuse me, and then the North Carolina guy. Um, I didn't haven't watched anything on the North Carolina guy. Um, I saw that he was highly ranked. Um, that's about my extent. But the Northern Iowa guy I saw a couple of clips of him, and he moves and he moves laterally extremely well. And that's the one thing of these middle linebackers this year that was that just ate them up. Any change of direction, any you know playing in space, which is a lot of what it looks like they get asked to do. Um, they just they couldn't really they couldn't really do it this year. So I yeah, think they, that's number one position they need. 
it seemed really indecisive too at times watching him on film. Like it was just they were always a step late. And part of that is probably a scheme change. Um, I will agree in Northern Iowa guy. My only question on him is how much they can bulk him up. I think you need to yeah. get him to at least mm-hmm. what yeah, they had on, at least in the 220 range. He's got to be yeah. there, or he's gonna really take a beating in the middle at, at two like I think it's two oh three. Really? And again. Who knows how accurate that is at this point in time? But he is a longer, leaner guy, so he's going to have to put a little bit of weight on. Yeah, on a, on a couple of clips, it, he kind of hit the guy and stopped. And that's <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's well. never a good right. sign. And, and that, yeah, that's that. There's some concern there, but you know, even packing on ten pounds, the way yeah. he, if he can still maintain a little bit of the way he moves, I mean, that's going to be huge. Yeah. A uh, question from Dark Ray. Justin, I want you to take this one. Are you guys concerned that we're bringing in guys that couldn't get on the field at their previous schools? What do you think, Justin? I think you need to take a look at the school they're coming from and and evaluate what their depth chart is. If you are if you don't know what you're looking at, what they're like, I've talked about ad nauseum kind of the, the Bama, Georgia, you know, Clemson guys. Like there's going to be guys who did not see the field at those schools that may have talent to play at a lot of schools, they just get recruited over. Like if they, if they bring in four or five star guys, if they hit guys who are ready to play day one and they're more athletic and they feel like they have more upside than the guy that's there, I will guarantee you they have guys on the roster that aren't playing that probably would be starting here. We just have guys that we grind out and really develop. Um, You're better off getting them as a red shirt freshman than getting them as a red shirt junior where the guy, if he still hasn't pushed at that point, he, he probably is not going to do a whole lot for you here because he's kind of set in the ways of and developed the way they have him, you know, to their scheme. And it's going to be really hard for that guy to transition. Whereas the first couple seasons, he's mostly getting his body right and getting ready to play. So I think there's, there's some legitimate guys that I think that they're bringing in that there's possibilities there with them. I, I agree with some of the things I've seen where people are talking about the FCS guys being all American types and having them jump a level. I think there's legitimate something to find there. Like there's, there's something to look at there as a scheme and, and finding guys who are just crushing it at that level, like Pius, who I think you bring him in. I think he has a chance to come up and be a really good player at this level with how productive he was. He clearly was the guys were overmatched at his level with his ability. Does that mean he's going to get us 10 sacks this next year? No. But if he can get five or six, that's a really nice add into that room. Yeah, well said. All right, let's get into Tyler Van Dyke a little bit. This is, um, you know, Austin has done a ton of great analysis on this, and I want to I talk through um, a, an article you put up on Badger Nose today, um, talk about all kinds of different stats. Now, you were one of the guys, Austin, that said that you actually wanted Finn over Van Dyke. Mm-hmm. Tell me why you wanted Finn over Van Dyke, and then now tell me, as you've done a deeper dive into Tyler Van Dyke, how do you feel about him? And let's talk through some of those stats that you that you put up. Yeah, I think with looking at the data, right, um, in, in Finn, in Tyler Van Dyke, their passing numbers at a high level, right, um, were pretty similar um, in terms of, you know, on target rates um, and looking at it. Um, at how far they're pushing the ball down the field. He he seemed to check the boxes, right? And and that's just purely from a data standpoint. Um, but the added benefit of Finn is just obviously the production with his with his feet. Um, he's pretty elite um, in terms of in the QB design run game, um, but also with the scrambles and avoiding pressure um, was just even a cut above Tyler Van Dyke, who we'll get into in the deep dive, but is is pretty um, adept at avoiding pressure. Um, so, I mean, that just really stood out. And I think where we saw Mordecai in this offense really shine is when he was using his feet to kind of create something out of nothing for us. Um, as we saw quite a lot of that, unfortunately with the offense this year. So I think that initially, um, took me into, into viewing that as more of a positive. Um, but obviously, right how do you adjust for Finn's quality of opponent, right? Playing in the Mac is not playing in Mm -hmm. playing against, you know, power five ACC teams like Florida state and Clemson um, who've got really high level athletes. Um, So obviously you got to knock Finn a little bit for that. And and the data analysis I was doing wasn't, Um, but yeah, I think his feet really gave Finn the edge for me. Um, 
but and i'll just dive in kind of into the post a little bit of the deep dive yeah, definitely um you know looking at how you know his stats uh, over the course of his career have really trended um he really came out of the gates really hot in 2021 um with pretty strong passing composites um and for for passing composite uh, that's just on target percentage which is essentially how often is he hitting the guy in the face mask um and that's data tracked by sports info solutions um if everyone is curious where i'm getting my data um and then that's coupled with um intended air yards per attempt right so how on target are you and how how far down the field does that kind of stretch um and he was really really good kind of in the the middle to late of 2021 in his uh, redshirt freshman campaign and it really fell off a cliff in 2022 obviously um Rhett Lashley moved on um from from oh, Miami the Josh Gaddis effect <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah one year stint um probably not a good good barometer for your offensive coordinator um and and really and i talk about this in the post is his on target percentage really didn't fluctuate that much um which signaled to me that obviously the reduction in passing composite was all due to his less aggressiveness down the field um kind of impacting his overall numbers um and in that I mean, you can you can probably say there's a bunch of different factors going into that, sure, but I think you got to put a little bit of that blame on the OC and the quarterback coach of how they're uh, they're coaching Tyler and and how he's attacking the defenses. Obviously, he really thrives based on what I've seen um, in in launching the ball downfield. Um, he's got really good on target percentages, well above what we've seen from other college QBs um, on passes over 20 yards. So it kind of what pro football focus would deem as a, a deep pass. Um, so really love what I'm seeing there from him. Um, and, and really in 2023, early on in the, in the year, his, um, his aggressiveness really ticked back up. Um, and he had some really great outings, especially versus Texas A&M um, was, was a really uh, great game for him in, in 2023. Um, so I, I'd love to see his aggressiveness tick back up. And I think, getting into Phil Longo's system um, and really what our team lacked. And I talk about this a little bit was Mordecai's deep ball throwing was lackluster is probably <laughs> a, a generous term. Yes. To throw there. Um, but that, that that's kind of a staple of Phil Longo's offense is really taking those deep shots along with a lot of these curl routes and, and swing routes and kind of the dink and dunk stuff is you've got to spread the defense out to make those more effective. And Mordecai really struggled, 39% or 38% on target on balls over 20 yards. So that that was kind of the missing piece of the offense this year. And obviously, right, Van Dyke's mobility in the QB design run game is, is, is not there, but he's really adept at avoiding pressure. And in 2023, I kind of talk about this later in the post, but uh, he didn't see any sack rates above 10%, which is pretty incredible. Um, and that's not just because he was seeing any lack of pressure. I mean, Miami's offensive lines have uh, not been great. Um, I, I'm not sure they're um, much, much better than Wisconsin O lines, or at least the uh, perception of how our offensive lines have been um, in the last few years. But I think he's going to get some better protection and, and hopefully he can do some great things. But the, the good thing I also saw with that is, um, his ability to push the ball down the field and kind of uh, take some shots downfield, even when he's under pressure, uh, maintained pretty strong over over the course of his career. So, I mean, as you dig into the data, obviously he he flashes the ceiling, right? There's a lot to um, look at at his highs and be wow, this guy's got some some pretty pretty great arm talent and, and flashes it really well. Um, but you can't you can't look at that without looking at 2022. Um, and, and transitioning, even in 2023, there was some highs, but really lows. Um, and a lot of that you could say is built off of going to a new OC, but he's coming to a new OC at Wisconsin too. So um, I think there's a lot to be excited about, but I'm pretty cautiously optimistic in, in that sense. Yeah. 
See now that right there is why we have Guard Your Fickle on the show. Amazing, like <laughs> just dad data stuff. It's it's great. Good to hear that stuff. So let's. I want to focus in a little bit on the deep ball accuracy, Austin. That's something that <clears throat> we. Anyone who watched Badger football last year knows that Mordecai was really, really bad at that. Um, so what specific data points did you look at in regards to that specifically? And I'm looking through your article right here right now to, to get an understanding of it. But you, you comment a lot on the deep ball accuracy, and even under pressure. What, what specifically are you seeing and are you looking at there? Yeah. So the one that's probably a good one to look at is the air yards per attempt um, by passing a positive of all the different pass depths. Um, so there's a pretty uh, tight correlation um, from air yards per attempt and passing composite when you look at the shorter attempts, right? So um, there's you're probably not going to have a lot of off-target throws on those little swing outs or stick concepts, uh, really shorter throws. But the thing that I liked is um, there's really only a handful of games um, in looking at it where he has a huge drop-off um, in passing composite uh, on those deep throws, which which means he's got pretty strong stability in his ability to maintain accuracy down the field. Um, so, and and that's where it's pretty surprising when you look at his 2022 campaign of why he wasn't, why he didn't maintain his aggressiveness downfield. Obviously there's some concerns when you look at um, the INT rates, um, the interception rates as he pushes the ball downfield. Um, those obviously spiked up uh, a good bit in 2022, but I mean, you can't, there's, there's an aspect of you're going to have to take some good with the bad and you don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater um, and his ability to, to push the ball downfield and kind of spread things out. Um, it is really important for any offense. Um, so I'm really excited to see that stuff um, out of him. Justin, what are your what are some of your concerns that you have with with TVD or or things that you're really excited about after you know just seeing more of his game and breaking it down a little bit? Well, watching him, the art, arm talent, like one of the biggest things that I struggled with Mordecai watching him this last year was he seemed so indecisive with his decision making when he was in the pocket, and it drove me nuts because we saw an an instant difference when they brought in um, Locke. And you could see how quickly he was just making his decision and getting rid of the football. And Mordecai really struggled with that. And I, you know, without being able to see the, the all 22 to see what's actually happening with the receiver routes, I don't know how open guys actually were, but my, my gut instinct was he's just not seeing it or he's not seeing guys until they're open. And that leads me to believe that he struggled either with the anticipation aspect of it or our receivers just weren't getting the separation that he, he felt comfortable with. And I, that's to me is the biggest impact we saw from him going from SMU to here is that I think the windows tightened a little bit and it changed how comfortable he was at letting it rip with the football. I don't have that same concern with Van Dyke because he's obviously had to play against power five teams left and right. And he's had to find those windows and, and make them happen. He's also got a much bigger arm than what Mordecai had, which is going to be a significant difference. Now the inter the interception rate, to me, that will rely heavily on what our running game can do for him. Uh -huh. Because if we do things correct in the running game, and he's going to have, listen, he's going to have receivers, especially out of the backfield, who are much better than what Mordecai had this last year because, for the love of God, I, I love the guys that we we had in that backfield and even Chez. Dupree is a much better receiver than, than anyone that we had on the roster this year out of the backfield already as a true freshman. The guy's just one of the more electric backs that I've ever seen catching the football out of the backfield. Um, Jones is also a very good one. And Atuka, I feel like the the three running backs, he's coming in early. He's going to have an opportunity to get ready to go. So from a running game standpoint, this offense is going to be a little different than what he had at Miami. It's probably closer to Lashley than anything else that he's been in. But I think it's even going to be a little bit more run heavy than Lashley probably was that year, which is going to hopefully give him a little bit more deception in the passing game and give him more ability to stretch the field. Um, still. I love the aggressiveness. I will take some interceptions if it means that we're also hitting on some big plays. If that stat line was what we had this year in the passing game, we were probably 10 and 2, 11 and 1 as a team. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I mean, look, we weren't we weren't even that we we had some real struggles this year, but mm -hmm. yeah, you're exactly right. You add in a guy that has this kind of talent, where would we have been? Right. I mean, think about that. Like there's so many times, how many wide open 
receivers did Mordecai miss down the field? It's it's mm-hmm. crazy. I mean, there was there were so many Wait, of them. You talked about um, the Purdue game watching uh, DK uh, like three straight times. You said three. They finally times. hit him the third time. He finally hit him on the route, but the mm-hmm. first two he was wide open, nobody covering him, and it's like, gosh, oh, yeah. yeah, that was awesome. That was the first game I went to this year, and I'm watching the receivers, watching the all twenty two, just gives you such a different perspective, and you can see how much how wide those open those receivers were and. DK most definitely was. I mean, my goodness. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm i a huge fan of what I see out of this guy. I said this before. I was actually on the Van Dyke versus Finn. I was on the Van Dyke side before um, because I didn't really want a Matt quarterback, honestly. I, I wanted a guy who's played in a Power 5 conference, and I think that's that's what he brings you. And you know that those numbers, when we looked at Mordecai's numbers, they were at SMU. Again, non-Power 5. And then you look at... You look at um, Van Dyke's numbers, they were at Miami. I know there's some drop-off, and I know there's some issues there, but... When you look at the Longo system, specifically the Longo system and how it relies on quick, decisive de- you know, decisions, and especially a lot of throws into the slant, um, like in, in the slot, like that's really important. And I want that quick decision making. And I think that with a strong arm, it just it, it really just adds that much more ability to him. Austin, what do you see as far as fitting into the Longo system specifically? Like I just mentioned, how do you feel like Van Dyke fits into everything you saw out of Longo? Throughout this past season, insert Van Dyke. How do you? How much better do you think we really are, and how does he fit into the plays that we're going to see? Yeah, I think I think he fits in pretty well. Um, another aspect of the post was just kind of looking at his play action RPO um, ability, and obviously the more, at least from the data, right, is the more you fed him play action RPOs and kind of work that into the passing game, he really thrived. Um, and so I. What was interesting to me is when Mordecai went out and Locke stepped in, our play action um, and RPO game actually went down a pretty hefty uh, percentage um, in usage. So I'm not sure exactly why that was with Locke. Um, but, and, and I think Van Dyke's size, I think, allows us to work a little bit more of the, the slant RPO action that I don't think we saw a ton of with Mordecai, right? It was a lot of, you know, tight end or H back leak outs or um, kind of screen bubble stuff in, in the RPO game. And that's not traditionally what you see from a lot of, um, you know, Alabama more spread out types. It's a lot of, um, you know, slant routes over the middle, putting that, that safety or um, kind of a player into conflict. And we just really didn't see that. And I wonder if that's not, uh, a lot of Mordecai in lock size. I mean, we saw a lot of balls batted down at the line of scrimmage. And that's a throw where you got to fit into some tight windows and work your arm angles um, and fit around uh, those Big Ten offensive lines and defensive lines. And we just really didn't see a lot of that. I think we'll see a lot more of that with Van Dyke watching his film and some of the highlight tapes. I mean, you see a bunch of, of those throws. Um, so I think he adds a little bit more of Dy- dynamic um, aspects into our short passing game, as well as um, those deep shots where he's just um, obviously a cut above Mordecai and what we've what we've seen over the past few years with even, you know, looking back at Hornybrook and, and Cone. Yeah, and then you're, you would, <clears throat> where, where do you kind of, based looking at the numbers, where do you rank sort of Van Dyke? I think I, I think I saw a comment in there that you had him sort of he didn't have the cone and, and the Warnerbrook numbers, but do you feel like he's close to that as far as yeah, what you're seeing and not seeing him on the field? Yeah, based on right eye, you know, regressing his passing composite over yards per attempt, he projects to be um, seven and a half yards per attempt, which would put him about a half a yard behind Hornybrook in 2017 and Cone in 2019. So definitely not a hundred percent there, right? But that's just using prior data to predict future, right? So what it, what what does his passing composite look like in Longo's system um, with you know a more competent offensive line um, and um, yeah and so I think there's a lot of unknowns obviously with projecting that type of stuff out um, you're it's really just a, a wild guess to be honest with you I mean there's some there, there there's some pretty decent correlation there. Um, but nothing that I would say absolutely mark him down seven and a half yards per attempt. That's where he's going to be at. Um, and if you look at over the history, and I added this into the post too, when we've got when our quarterbacks in games, when they kind of cross that seven and a half yards per attempt threshold, um, I think we've lost one game over the past 
five years. So that that aspect of being efficient in the passing game, it doesn't need to be, you know, crazy Michael Penix, Caleb Williams, 10 yards per attempt, just gashing you through the air. We just need some level of competent quarterback play mm-hmm. um, and, and we'll be just fine. Um, obviously, that's in the context of Jim Leonard's defense and really solid play there. Um, although, we, and we can talk about Jim Trussell or and and what we not Jim Trussell, Mike, Mike Trussell, Trussell, excuse me, Mike Trussell, um, and, and what we saw from the defense last last season. Um, but I think um, just any sort of competent quarterback play and really being able to actually spread the, the field out and take some guys out of the box because we we saw a ton of cover one. Um, played against us in loaded boxes still, even though we played 85% of our um, possessions in 11 personnel, right? We're trying to spread the field, but with Mordecai's inability to stretch it, um, I mean, we had the same same problems. So um, I think Van Dyke um, in that ability, I think is a really hidden, hidden gem in that aspect. Yeah. A few comments coming in here. John Smith says upgrading the tight end position will be huge. Uh, we got a few comments here about, uh, you know, Mertz and where Van Dyke might uh, come into that. Uh, Dark Ray says, Nick Evers would be really good in the RPO. He should be at least used in certain packages next year. Austin, I, Justin and I have talked about this a lot. What's your take on Nick Evers? Do you feel like he, he for, I think we all can agree, he needs a place in this offense at least somewhat. What's your take on him? Thoughts on how he can somehow get into the system and, and get into the offense a bit? Yeah, I mean, looking at him, passes every eye test. I mean, just the raw talent jumps off the screen at you. It's unlike anything we've ever seen from a better, better quarterback. I mean, he, he looks even more dynamic than Russell Wilson, right? Just given his size and his top end speed um, from what you see from his high school highlight film and um, seen some other videos on, on Twitter um, highlighting some of his Oklahoma practice um, throws. I saw that come across Twitter a few weeks ago. Uh, but I always go back to Phil Longo. Whenever he was asked about him in kind of the spring, he would just go back to the knowledge equals reps. And I guess if if that's what he's kind of going back to every time, that's what's holding him back. Um, and raw talent can only do so much as you kind of continue jumping up in levels of, of competition and the windows get, get tighter and tighter and you can't overpower it with your raw athletic ability. And I, I think at this point, all we can know from what we've heard through through Longo in, in the media is that knowledge equals reps for, for Nick Evers. So I'm hoping um, that another offseason and another spring brawl where he can kind of begin to put um, his study of the playbook into more reps um, that he wasn't getting um, as the third string for most of this year, third and fourth string, really. Um, and so I'm excited to see what what this spring can do for, for him. I think it'll be a big one for him and it'll probably tell us whether or not he's, he's going to be able to make that jump. Obviously with Van Dyke coming in, that may limit a little bit, but we'll see. Yeah. I I find it really interesting coming off of the, this last season and taking a look at what these guys, it, it tells me the fact that we even went after Van Dyke, that they were not enamored with the QB room. Um, So that tells me that there was nobody that they felt was like a lock to be, a quality starter this next year. So it may be that they are waiting on Matoya to be the guy after a red shirt year. Now, whether that happens or not, and, and it's very possible that we do see a step up here from, you know, someone like Evers, because like we said, he's got all the physical talent in the world. It's going to be huge for him this spring. And, and I, honestly, I, to me, this is a spring. If, if he does, if it doesn't click this year where he starts to, to, build and show that the that things are starting to click then you'd have to start to worry whether ever he's ever going to take the step and be able to to make the jump it's possible but the longer time goes by the less likely it is that he's going to be a difference maker at the college level if he if he doesn't start to take steps yeah i mean the reality is you said you said it right spring is everything yeah i i don't i don't really don't think he's gonna end up staying here because i think there's other even other situations where he can go and now if you look at eliminating the penalty for having to transfer again, I mean, at this point, who really knows what's going to happen with it? But well, we've talked about Tyler Van Dyke a little bit. By the way, Austin, anything else you want to talk about with Van Dyke? Any other data or numbers that you feel like you want to touch on with with his game at all? No, I think I pretty much hit all of it. I would just say that 
his his ability to pick up yards on the ground is is non non existent really. I mean, there's a couple of scrambles. <laughs> he wants to throw. <laughs> yeah, there's a couple of scrambles here and there. Um, but when I when you think about judging a quarterback on his mobility, I think one of the bigger metrics is to look at his sack to pressure ratio. Um, and that improved year over year and was, I mean, pretty elite level um, in looking at the lexicon of other college quarterbacks this year. I mean, he he avoided pressure extremely well. And I think that just goes to, you know, he's in his fourth year um, and third year as a, a power five starter. He knows how to maneuver himself through the pocket. Um, and I think that'll be that'll suit him well in terms of. Uh, getting into our offense and, and being able to, to make plays and not let um, some light pressures here and there really, really hurt us. I feel like that's really the key is we, we wanted someone that had experience, real experience. We're at a power five university, which he does. So he, this is not, it's not like the brights are going to be too, the lights are going to be too bright for this guy. They're not. I mean, it's, and they, they shouldn't have been for Mordecai and they probably weren't, but at the end of the day, he really struggled stepping into the big 10 and I don't expect Van Dyke to have those same issues. And remember that we still have Braden Locke and I'm not, this is not guaranteed to be Tyler Van Dyke's job. Now it probably is, but Braden Locke is a good player. We still got Evers. We have Met Tower. Like there's so many people now that what you have is a true competition for this position. And what we wanted out of the portal was someone who could come in and be a veteran quarterback who could provide depth to that room, which is exactly what we've done. I think we've done that really, really well. Um, let's move on a little bit from, from quarterback, Justin, what position group are we most concerned with headed into the offseason now? I mean, so there are some there are some areas where we've, we've seen some improvement. We've got some additions. But overall, what are you most concerned about? Uh, for me, honestly, it's the wide receiver room. Um, I, even, I, even with the Henry edition, you're still you're still really worried about it. Um, until I actually see production from this group, I I will not feel good about it because – we thought of coming into spring last year that we had a lot of depth and that might, might be the best room that we've seen, you know, probably since I was following the Badgers. And they really were a letdown this last season. And a lot of it was controllable things from that group. A lot of drops, a lot of situations where guys didn't make plays. And, and some of them were tough plays. But we I've seen good wide receiver rooms have guys make plays. And I like I said, I, Kansas was a team. They're, they're my kind of, you know, secondary team because I love uh, Leipold and watching their receivers who were guys that were probably far further down the recruiting rankings than the guys that we had in our room this last year, making crazy big time catches for that team. You start to look at it and go, well, what's missing with this group that we just can't seem to get a guy that can go out there and catch the ball because the drops, we had to have been one of the highest teams in the country in terms of drop rate. So, from that standpoint, we need to really clean up the things we can control and the offense will be a lot better. Like it, it, that's really, honestly, as much as we talk about the makeover for this team and what we need on the defensive side, we are, we were a significantly better team. If we were averaging 28 points per game, we, we probably were a nine or 10 win team. If we, if we do that and tw- what were we 22 and a half or something like that, or 23, it was, it was rough year offensively. It's really funny to think back to our horrible takes at the beginning of the season mm-hmm. when we said 30. J- Justin, I believe, yeah. was like, I have 30 touchdowns, no problem. Yeah. We were arguing oh, between God. 10 and 12 interceptions, 3,000 yards, no problem. Yeah, we, we definitely hit on the, I, I hit on the <laughs> interception rate where I said it was going to be low. So I, 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 can, I, I can take that one. I wrote a piece in the preseason that talked about Heisman hopes for Mordecai. So I don't think anybody's done it worse than me. <laughs> I mean, I I did talk about Heisman hopes for Braylon Allen. I talked about like how everyone should be betting on Wisconsin to win the national, the Big Ten championship because mm-hmm. it's only one game. But I mean, assuming that we were going to win the West, I mean, talk about just a complete disaster that was. Austin, positions for you that you're most concerned about going into the off season? Yeah, I think. I mean, Justin, you talked about it a little bit earlier um, about you know the the running back room and the recruits that we're bringing in this year. But I mean, with Braylon Allen gone and Chez's future up in the air. I'm pretty concerned with that room um, dropping off to a level that we haven't really seen over the last decade and a half of Wisconsin football, just from right. If Chez come back, Chez comes back. That's it's a pretty different story. I think you've got a, a really solid guy that you can give 20, 25 carries to, 
Um, but who's that next guy, right? And Jackson Aker, Kate Yakimeli, they they really didn't flat, right? Yeah. I don't think they really flashed at all. No. Um, Aker maybe more than Yakimeli, but I mean, you're talking one to two plays out of a 50 play sample size, and that's just that's just not enough. Mm-hmm. And I struggle with how much is Dupree and Jones going to be able to come in right away um, and help that room out. Um, and then you, you couple that with, you know, are we going to put Van Dyke in a 50 throw a game situation? And is that setting him up for the most success? Um, I just, I struggle with that. And that's, that's what keeps me up at night as a Badger fan of looking at 2024 um football is what is that running back in room gonna look like and if Ches leaves i mean and we pick up nobody in the portal i mean really that's that's the room that we're gonna have I, oof. I mean i think i would hope that there's discussions being happening right now but with with Ches, like if Ches is not going to be back we're definitely going to fill that spot in the portal there's no yeah. way we're not going to do that and there's a spring cycle too of the right the exactly uh, Bird Dogger says Williams should break out, but who knows for sure. Currently, only Pauling is a starting Big Ten receiver. Dark Ray, I agree with this. Dark Ray, he says we need Bryson Williams and CJ to step up for us. If they do, we will be fine at wide receiver. We do have a lot of wide receivers still in that room. I'm not saying we had a lot of people that really stepped up and yeah. played really well, but that room is pretty stacked still from a perspective yeah. of bodies and people that should be able to contribute. I mean, we have there's a lot of people that we even haven't seen yet, and but not to mention the main man, the Vegas guy, Tretch Kekahuna. I mean, there's, I'm really not worried about the receiver room. That's why I kind of was like, I was asking that. I disagree with that, Justin. But for me, it's offensive line. I said it before. I don't think there's much, much, not much more to say. I am very concerned about the old line because we need depth and we need bodies in there. I, the recruits look okay, but this is, this is going to be a concern and we need to get that fixed in my opinion. But, um, all right, Lance, let's transition a little bit to basketball. Um, Lots to talk about here. We're in the we're in a bit of a lull period. We play Jacksonville State. We got Chicago State, and then there's probably the the holiday period, and then we move into the Big Ten season. Um, Austin, initial takes on the basketball team thus far this season, and how you feel about um, you know the, the, where we are in, in as far as in, in the Big Ten. Yeah, I think I think there was a lot of question marks coming into the year, especially with how you know, from January on basically post Tyler Wall's injury, what, what that season looked like last year. Um, and then what was AJ store going to be? Um, and then the, the incoming freshman, um, cause you bring basically everybody, but Jordan Davis back. Um, and I think they've exceeded pretty much, I, w- I would say probably everyone's expectations of where they would be this year, obviously laid an egg versus Providence in Arizona. Um, they're only true road games this year, I believe. Um, I saw someone call that out um, as maybe a question mark as they go into, or well, Michigan State's a, a true road game, excuse me. Um, so, and obviously that's one of the most hostile environments. But they've laid two two eggs, um, and those are, and they've lost three games, Tennessee, Providence, and Arizona, and those are three of the best defenses we've faced all year. I mean, we played 11 games and six of those opponents are top 20 um, defenses in the country from Ken Palm's standpoint. So we, I mean, we've gone through the gauntlet and we're still putting up extremely high points per possession um, metrics. Now the concern really is defensively. Um, they, they've struggled at times this year. Um, and I think a, a lot of that um, is from, from the second unit, um, Nolan Winter in particular, uh, Connor Cesian, we'll talk about him a little bit later. Um, but I think the the backups haven't been as strong from a defensive standpoint other than, you know, Carter Gilmore. Um, and so if there's one area of this of this team that I'm pretty concerned about, um, it would be the defensive end. But on the flip side of that, I mean, when we faced Marquette, one of the best offensive teams in the country, we, we flat out shut them down um, in the first half, um, gave up a, a little bit of an early run in the second half, but really controlled – um, everything that they wanted to do um, in their kind of continuous ball screen, side ball screen action with Kolek. I mean, we shut them down. And that's one of the best offenses in the country. So the ceiling is there um, on both ends um, at a really high level. And I'm really excited about that. Yeah, it's interesting. You bring up the um, the defensive, as far as the bench goes, and there the defensive sort of liabilities we have there. 
I'm interested to see what the the rotation does now. I mean, even in the Jacksonville State game, you didn't see a ton of minutes, you know, large minutes off the bench for a lot of people other than Blackwell and Winter a little bit. I think Winter had 14 minutes. Mm-hmm. Um, but as we continue on to the season, Justin, do you expect that with, with Winter's issues defensively and especially with the CGN's defensive issues, I mean, Gilmore is not the guy that we really want to see in there. Yes, he brings some defensive pressure, but otherwise it's – the question is where – What's this rotation going to look like as we progress forward into the Big Ten season when, as Austin rightfully rightfully points out, you have some defensive issues? Yeah, I think you have to look at it and say, when it comes to winter, we need you to just take your lumps. And hopefully by the end of the season, it starts to click for you so that you start playing at a higher level. Because he's got the body. He's going to be a guy who I think is going to learn much more than anybody else on the roster. Just being a freshman, like defensively, his rotations and everything, they will improve as the season goes on. It just might look ugly along the way. But if you want to make a run in March, he's going to have to be a guy that you can afford to rely on coming coming in, especially in a game if Crowell gets in foul trouble. So the goal with him is not that you're expecting him to be a high-level defender. It's can he be adequate out there? And if he can be adequate, then that's that's enough. The bigger thing with him, honestly, for me right now, is I want to see him start to feel a little bit more confident in the offensive end because he's very hesitant on that side. And that's something for him where if he can start to apply a little pressure the other way, I think his confidence in his defense and everything else will take off a little bit for him. Um, but he's he's very tentative right now. That's, that's the difference with – we would have taken that – we would have thought that would be Blackwell far more likely given the type of – hesitancy that he had as a high school player but he seems like he's a dude out there just like no i got this he's just attacking at will and like it's, it's kind of shocking i i think that he will continue to develop that and he will get more confident uh dark ray says nate reavers was better than winter at this point which concerns me i'm not really concerned about winter I mean, you guys all know how i feel about winter i think he's going to be amazing it will take time it will take confidence to grow uh, but i think that 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 will come with time and at that five position as i said before many times crowd needs to speaking of confidence he needs to shoot more he shot a little bit in the in the jacksonville state game the more he shoots the more spacing is, is better and the more that you can really have our athletes attack um, because look, we've got a lot of great players on this team. There's no doubt about that. So you all probably saw that Purdue beat Arizona. Yes, because why I really, really wanted to see Arizona go down after so many lovely Arizona fans, um, you know, watched our show and made some very nasty comments to me. Well, it's really to Justin because just really it was Justin that picked us to yeah. go down there and beat that team. But um, the way they weren't nasty. I'm gl- very glad the Ohio the Arizona fans participated in the show but it was nice to see them lose a little bit but the one thing that's i think a lot of people have noticed and a lot of people are agreeing with is that this team our wisconsin badgers are certainly better off than we thought they were going to be that the national media thought they were going to be um when you look at preseason big 10 rankings what that was going to look like now it looks like the badgers are probably one of the top teams in the big 10 obviously we're not purdue and we're not going to be that but we are probably looking at number two three four somewhere in that area I think it's time to at least ask the question, can this team do the unthinkable? We have athletes we didn't have before. We have scoring we didn't have before. We're getting to the foul line. We're making our free throws. We're shooting a pretty decent percentage from three. And we've got the ability to score in many different ways. Can this team go on a run, Austin, in March and potentially make it back to the promised land of the Final Four? And if so, what is it going to take for that to happen? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was uh, I was thinking about this, um, and I think it, it boils down for me to two things. Um, first is Chucky's got to shoot the ball a little bit better than what he's doing right now, um, especially, especially when you look at just simple catch-and-shoots type stuff. I mean, obviously, late shot clock situations where he's coming off the pick and roll and um, getting some, some tough mid-range two looks. Um, you're going to have to live with that. I'd love if he would, you know, come off those and, and just shoot the three, uh, just from an analytics standpoint. Um, he's a really great three point shooter. Um, and you know, three is worth more than two. Um, but I, even, even mid shot clock, some opportunities that he'd been getting, he hasn't been converting on them. Um, and I think that's going to be crucial as we get into big 10 play and get into some situations where, you know, we need some buckets and, you know, they've got guys who can match up and body with store 
wall crawl and kind of keep them out of their bread and butter, which has been really easy paint and, and paint touches. So I think that's first and foremost, if we're going to, you know, think about making a final four run or a deep run in the NCAA tournament. And then the second one is kind of what Justin was talking about with Nolan Winter is, right, you you can't have Carter Gilmore play extended minutes in the tournament and expect to, to win some of those games. You need a guy um, who can come in and, and play really good minutes. Um, and I think Nolan Winter has got a super, super high ceiling. Um, he hasn't flashed, I think, some of his off-the-dribble game. Um, he's... He looked to your point, he looks a bit tentative, right? He's making the pump fake, he's taking the one dribble, and he's just afraid to take that second dribble, take the bump, um, and get into the lane and do some of that Frank Kaminsky type stuff that we saw in 2013 through 2015. I think that there's he's definitely got the skill there. Um, and then really defensively, it's a lot of his pick and roll, um, ball screen coverage. Um, Greg Gard loves to play drop coverage and he just gets a little too high unless the guy, um, roll in behind him. And, and we saw a ton of that in Arizona lobs to Balo. I, you know, got nightmares still of watching mm -hmm. that. Um, he needs to take kind of those next steps. Um, and in Jacksonville state, I thought, I thought he actually played a pretty good game on the defensive end. Um, and, and is why he got pretty significant minutes. Um, 14, where you didn't see a lot of other bench players um, get a lot of minutes. So I think Chucky um, adding a little bit, I mean, he's adding so much from what he's doing from a di distribution standpoint. I mean, he's three to one assist to turnover ratio, I think is what he's got right now. Um, and just the way he's commanding the floor is spectacular, but you need um, a little bit because he's one of the, the guys um, that's going to be able to create buckets. Um, late in the shot clock and we need to see him convert those a little bit better. Um, and then Nolan winter, we just need a little bit more depth in the front court as part of Gilmore versus top 64 teams in the country. Can't play five on four. Can't play five on four. Yeah. My perspective on this is a little bit different. I, I look at it as you need somebody who can actually carry you offensively. And I think that that you need store to basically take off as the season goes on, he's got to be more efficient. He's got to be more aggressive in terms of attacking the rim. Uh, he's, he's been pretty aggressive in terms of wanting to take shots, but not all of the shots have been great situational shots. And I think that he's a guy that needs to go. It, it's okay to get a foul and not be able to convert a dunk, like go up and, and be willing to just attack the rim because he's capable of doing that against most of the teams that we play. Um, you're, you're dead on him, Winter. He's got to be a guy that can provide some of that size off the bench. Um, and I think Blackwell, if he can give you another step where he can get up, where, where he's just more consistent in terms of his scoring, like he's going to have to start siphoning off minutes from Klesmet because I think that he is capable of being – he honestly right now is our most efficient player. When I watch him play, he's he's so adept at getting the line. Even So even when he doesn't convert – he typically makes something good happen out of it. Um, but from that standpoint, he, at times he does have a few defensive lapses here and there, but I, I as in terms of what he brings to the offensive side, I just, he, there's so much positive that he does when he's on the court. It's kind of shocking to me that he's not a better plus minus player than what we've seen, given how productive he seems to be whenever he's out on the court. And I want to be clear. I don't think that we're going to the final no, four. I've seen some yeah. comments in here saying that I don't yeah. think that, but I do think it's what would have beat, to happen. I think. Yeah. It, and when you beat the number three team in the country as handily as we did, and when you beat a team like Marquette, and, and I'm not saying we we played we played horribly against Arizona, but we can. And I think even Bo Dragon even said in here somewhere, we can beat or lose to pretty much any team, and I think that's fair. We absolutely can beat those teams. We might get Purdue this. We might be Purdue one of these one of the games we played this year. Who knows? I do think it's fair <clears throat> when you add the kind of at, 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 excuse me the kind of athleticism that we did and the players that we did that it's fair to at least look at it based on what we've seen from our team so far this year. 
So for me, it's I agree with everything you guys said. Um, scoring droughts have to be completely eliminated if we're going to do this. Blackwell has to continue to take off. Store, like you said, Justin, has to take off and really be the guy. And and I agree with you, uh, Austin, about Chucky. At, first of all, I think Chucky's had a great season, by the way. I think he looks fantastic out there. He's dropped the weight. Um, how well he looks distributing the ball is good. And I think that the one thing I, I didn't like about Chucky last year is that he took so many fadeaway shots that just did not work. And this year, his so shot selection has been far superior. So do I think this team's going to the Final Four? Absolutely not. Do I think a case can be made that if we have the right, if you put the right pieces in place, could it happen? Sure, anything can happen in a single elimination tournament. One of the things that probably does need to get better, though, is seeing Connor Asijian out there because he was the guy that scored the most points for us last year, and, and not the most, but he has—he was by far our most consistent shooter. And this year, he's basically been non-existent. Um, Greg Gard recently had some comments where he said he's in a funk right now. I think he's better than he where he was two or three weeks ago. He understands it. He's been very coachable. He's got to continue to be more physical defensively. We're working on some things with his feet, his balance, those types of things. We need him, but he's got to continue to grow defensively. Um, Austin, his minutes have dropped considerably from 25 down to basically four or five minutes a game. Do you see a path forward for Connor Asijian on this team this year and moving into future seasons? Do I see a path forward? I mean, absolutely. It, it just all comes on the defensive end for him. Um, if he can't consistently guard, um, and we're not even talking about the number two wing. I mean, the, their worst wing, every time they're out on the floor, he can't consistently guard. And that was something that was covered up last year. Um, when you look at his ability um, to shoot the ball, and that really fell off a cliff on the back end of last year. And we haven't, we haven't seen it come back. Um, and obviously, getting hurt in the second game of the year versus Tennessee obviously stunted a little bit of that progress, but if he can't, if he can't guard, there's no way that he's going to be stealing any of Blackwell store or Klesmit minutes right now. And he's going to have to to prove in, in the slim runs that he get, or if we, we get into some foul trouble from Klesmit who had some, some issues there early in the season and, and equally with store and Blackwell, and we have to see some consistent minutes um, from Isijan just out of necessity, and he performs well, I think that's really the only opportunity that he's going to get because, I mean, pushing Blackwell down for Isijan right now, I mean, that just would make that would make absolutely no, no sense, sense to, to right. anybody. Um, and just because, I mean, Blackwell... He does so many things shooting well. Really, he's shooting really well, and he's more dynamic than a season yeah. in his ability to exactly. attack the hoop and get to the free throw line. And those are free buckets right there. And a season really hasn't flashed that at all as part of his offensive game. He's really um, more of a sniper. So. Yeah. I was going to say one more thing about the, the tournament run thing. And I think an underlying aspect for this particular team is they, it's going to be matchup dependent for them. Like they are a team that right. they need the right matchups to be able to make a deep run. Um, I, I think they're capable of that. Um, if they can, you have to maximize what you can do uh, oh, during the regular season. If they can do that, I feel like the opportunity is there for them to be a second weekend team. And if anything that they can do beyond that, if they get hot, great. Um, regarding yeah, Connor. I, oh, oh, sorry. Oh. I would just say, yeah, like anybody who's going to be more physical than us, keep them out of our, out okay. of our region, right? <laughs> Arizona, Purdue, anybody who's going to, Match us. Just keep all the best in our yeah. bracket. We'll keep be fine. Them, keep them on the <laughs> other side. Because um, you look at Marquette, I mean, we out physical them. We match them up and we just basically put it to them. Um, if we can get some of those matchups, I, I think there's no doubt. I mean, you look at our rebounding ability, offensive and defensive. I mean, we're out. This is probably the best rebounding we, team we've had in the Ken Palm era. Um, we're attacking the glass really hard. But Arizona obviously had the dudes to match up with mm -hmm. us physically and just kept us off off the old boards, and that really hampered us. Mm -hmm. Justin, what was your take on Connor? Yeah, I mean, I I've seen fans really getting upset with him not playing more, and I've I've kind of really paid attention now when he comes out on the floor to what exactly is going on, and people are getting frustrated with this. But we are he is being targeted by the other team 
every time he hits the floor. Like they they will instantly give it to the person that is he's covering, and normally they get down on him just downhill on him just about every time. So I don't know what they think we're going to do when you have a guy that can be exploited to the level that he's getting exploited right now. Like he's got to find a way to fight and at least make whoever he's guarding uncomfortable. Like if you can at least get in front of them and take the drive away, I'll, I'll deal with somebody drilling threes over you. If it means that you're not allowing them to get in the paint, because right now, every time he's out there, they're just going right around him and going downhill. And that's, that's going to lead to easy buckets. It's going to lead to free throws, get your other guys in foul trouble. And that's, you can't have him causing crawl to go to the bench because he's picking up a foul because you couldn't stay in front of your man. That's the type of issues that potentially he's causing right now. It's a great, point. right? I mean, look, I said it at the beginning of the show and I'll say it again here at the end of the show. I think this is the last year we're going to see Connor play for the team because of what we're, what we have in Blackwell. And look, the other thing that's really not helping him is that he's shooting 23% from three. Like, that's not helping him, right? He's the one thing that he's really good at is a three point specialist, but he's not making them when he has the chances. Now, he's not taking enough. And if he was out there for 25 minutes a game, he probably would get out of that shooting funk. But at the end of the day, you're right. I think you said it perfectly. They're targeting him, they know he's on the floor, they're going to attack him. He's he can't play defense, he can't play there. And frankly, We've got a, we've got guys coming in next year that are gonna that are gonna battle for minutes as well. I just don't see how this guy really stays as part of this team going forward. I don't think he's gonna be in the rotation this year. And I, I really unless you have an injury or major foul trouble, which of course is gonna be different. But unless that happens, I really don't see a situation where this, where this guy has meaningful minutes the remainder of the year. I, I just I can't see it at all. Yeah, unless he absolutely catches fire. I, I just don't know what's going to happen. He's, he'd have to start shooting borderline fifty percent the rest of the year. Do you think this hey, is last year for that's our what team? Blackwell shooting? I mean, Blackwell is over yeah. forty, over forty percent. I mean, Andy guards, Andy, yeah. Andy attacks. He rebounds team. really well. He plays yeah. better, above average defense. So yeah. And the thing is, from a from a depth standpoint, if a season can you know be a guy who comes in seven to eight minutes, right? I think. That's probably the max of what he's going to be able to get. If he can defend and, you know, come in and knock down, you know, go one for two or one for three in eight minutes of play and give us a bucket when we're struggling offensively, that's another aspect of going to push us from a NCAA tournament standpoint to go a little bit farther, right, to, to stop those droughts um, a little bit, little bit quicker. Um, mm-hmm. It's going to be huge, but it's all defensive for him. And – and like you, like you said earlier, Rajiv, it's like you, you're not going to just pick up how, learning how to play defense um, right. over the course of a year. It's like you either you either got it or you don't. And unfortunately, um, doesn't look like he's got it. That is what it is. Austin, this has been fantastic. Uh, guard your fickle. He's a great follow on Twitter. Badger notes wherever you can find his work. Go out, go out there and check it out. Um, he will continue to do deep dives into analytics, and I love that kind of stuff. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, next week is Christmas Eve, so I don't think we're going to be doing a Sunday show next week. Justin might do something on Christmas Eve. I don't think so, but I won't. Uh, but next <laughs> week we will be doing. Um, Ryan is going to be doing his third annual giveaway show on Locked On Badgers, um, which I think Justin and I are going to be part of that. Um, I've got a few gifts that I'm going to be contributing to that as well. Super, super fun. Wishing everyone a happy holiday season. Merry Christmas to all of you. Thank you so much for your early early support of the Bucky Report. Um, Justin and I have had so much fun doing this mm-hmm. and getting guys like Austin on the show. We're going to keep doing more of that. Uh, so thank you all very much. Justin, any last words? Well, everyone have a safe holiday. Uh, take it easy. Get some rest and relaxation in. And uh, yeah, we'll keep rolling, rolling with this. Thanks That's for right. everyone for listening. Absolutely. Austin, thank you again so much. Um, you were a, a great addition to the show, and we hope to have you back on in the future, and you're welcome back anytime. Awesome. Yeah, thanks. Really appreciate you guys having me on and uh, getting getting the Badger analytics out there um, for, for more people to see. Um, and again, happy holidays to everybody. Um, sorry for the mic troubles oh, early. We got that figured out, but uh, all is good. Tech yeah. problems are a part of this kind of stuff, especially when you do a live show. Thank yeah. you all for listening. Uh, And until next time, on Wisconsin. On Wisconsin.
Thank you for listening. If you enjoy the show, subscribe to our YouTube channel at The Bucky Report or The Bucky Report Podcast from wherever you get your content. Until next time, on Wisconsin. Wisconsin.